Last week, we looked at the devastating diagnosis of Jesus about why the world is so messed up. Out of men's hearts, evil thoughts come, he said. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. We are almost blind now to the everyday ways we try to mitigate against the problems of being a society of sinners. But as we said last week, all the keys in our pockets, all the internet passwords witness to the truth of the diagnosis of Jesus. Incidentally, alcohol is another great way of revealing what's going on in our hearts. I mean, what happens when people get drunk? Does losing your inhibitions make people kinder, gentler, better people? No would be the answer of the police who have to deal with a lot of antisocial behavior, domestic violence and sexual assault when people get drunk. The problem, of course, is fundamentally not the alcohol. It is the human heart that is revealed by the alcohol. This is the diagnosis of Jesus. All these evils come from inside a person and defile them. It's a devastating diagnosis, isn't it? But what can be done? Well, Mark wrote this account not to kind of give us despair, but because he wanted to share with us the really great news about Jesus, the good news against this backdrop of our great problem. And so immediately after the diagnosis, he recounts three events in the life of Jesus that are, that are wonderful signs advertising the solution to this terrible heart problem. I mean, there are lots of unusual details in this section of Mark's gospel that has already been read to us that, that, that are covered in these events. His dialogue with a, with a woman, which results in an unclean spirit being cast out of her daughter, the healing of a deaf and mute man, and then the feeding of 4,000 people in a remote place. And today, I, I want to explain how these events put together are significant signs that could be good news for us today, for you today. The first sign is this, to see someone who rescues enslaved people. In verses 24 to 30, we see Jesus healing a demon-possessed girl. Now, any parent watching this has probably had that experience of dragging your children around the shops when they're tired and agitated. And the worst scenario comes when they end up screaming aloud and rolling around on the shop floor in full sight of 30 onlookers. At times like that, we can feel like our kids are possessed. Uh, the, that tiny insight might help us see what a terrible situation this mother found herself in. Mark has already described the devastating impact of evil spirits, self-harming, isolation, screaming, a, a tortured soul. And, and what a terrible situation. She was in a helpless situation. Uh, her little girl was possessed by this evil personality, enslaved by it. And yet Jesus merely speaks and the child is set free. She gets a brand new life of freedom. Now it makes you think, doesn't it? What sort of person can rescue enslaved people? Well, the Jewish people knew of such a person from their history. This is how God acted in history for them. They'd once been enslaved people in Egypt, oppressed, cruelly treated. They'd cried out to the Lord God and he heard them. He came and delivered his people out of their slavery. He showed himself to be their redeemer, their rescuer, freeing them from Egypt, keeping them through the, the, the wilderness wanderings and bringing them to their own land of Canaan. Here we see Jesus doing something very similar. Here is someone who can rescue enslaved people. Now, what is remarkable about this sign is where it took place. Look again at 7 verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the village of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. Tyre and Sidon are outside of Israel. Tyre is the area that we know today as Lebanon. Uh, this is Gentile territory, non-Jewish territory. This is an area where paganism flourished. So what was Jesus doing here? Well, probably getting away from all the heat of opposition. If you remember last week, the religious leaders were already plotting to kill him before he denounced them as, as religious hypocrites. And from verse 24, it looks like Jesus wants some anonymity, some rest and peace, perhaps to teach his disciples. But the fame of Jesus makes this impossible. And so this quiet house is disrupted by a noisy woman. Uh, she bursts in on the scene and falls at the feet of Jesus, begging him to help her heal her daughter. 
the, the last person who fell at the feet of Jesus was Jairus. Remember the president of the synagogue? You, you couldn't get a bigger contrast between Jairus and this woman. Um, the confrontation that Jesus just had with the religious leaders was about what makes you clean or unclean before God. And according to the Jewish tradition of the elders, this individual has the most against her. Uh, verse 26 gives the reasons why no self-respecting Jewish man would have had anything to do with her. Um, she was a woman, number one. She was a Greek Gentile. She was from the infamous pagans of Syro-Phoenicia. So even Levi, the tax collector, would have raised his eyebrows at this woman who had the temerity to, to beg Jesus to heal, help her daughter. But by the end of the story, it's clear that Jesus does not see our human status, but our human need. But if that is true, why does he give this woman such a hard time? I mean, she was living in a nightmare and Jesus' response seems very odd if you look at verse 27. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It seems a very shocking thing for Jesus to say, don't you think? Uh, if you don't think so, um, why don't you compare your wife or girlfriend to a dog this week and see what reaction you get. Uh, the Jewish people used to refer to the Gentiles as dogs as a basic slur about their feeding habits. Dogs will eat almost anything you stick in front of them. And the Jews kept a very strict dietary code while Gentiles did not. I'm sure the Gentiles were equally disobliging against the Jews. But what is being said here? Well, it's a parable about priorities. It's wrong to put the cart before the horse. Unless you're a very sick and twisted animal lover, you don't take the food for your children and, and, and feed it to your dog first. At this stage in history, Jesus had a priority to reach out to Israel, often called God's children in the Old Testament. He was the Jewish Messiah, and his mission was to, first and foremost, to reach his fellow Jews. Now, on paper, uh, it still seems a very confrontational way of spelling this out to this Gentile woman. But what you can't tell as you're reading this account is the way that Jesus said it. It would make a big difference, wouldn't it, if he said it with a playful smile rather than a scowl. And I think by her response, Jesus said it in a gentle way, not to put her down, but to draw out her incredible faith. Her response to Jesus is the most remarkable yet in Mark's gospel. Lord, she replied, um, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She understood and accepted what Jesus was saying. She knew that she had no right on his time. She knew that she had no call on his favour. Her response is one of considerable humility, isn't it? You don't need to interrupt the meal plans, Jesus. All I'm asking for is a scrap from the table. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. I think what is so amazing here is that this pagan woman gets just a one sentence parable from Jesus and she gets it. <laughs> the brief parable discloses to her the mystery of the kingdom. Look what she does in contrast to nearly everyone else in Mark's gospel. She hears the parable of Jesus, she accepts it, although it was a humbling experience, and she engages with Jesus on his terms. And in it, she hears an invitation to relate to Jesus as Lord and rescuer. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now, Jesus didn't say that the dogs will never get fed, but that the children should be fed first. And she took Christ at his word. She heard the word first and she realizes that she can be next. And so actually Jesus treats her like a child of Israel. Well, what about us? Do we recognize our need? I think the average Brit or American just assumes that God will accept us just as we are because we're just basically good people. We're so lovable. We're so wonderful. Of course God will accept us. But remember what we learned last week. That's not our state. Uh, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, 
greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is what Jesus says about us. There's no basis in why God should ever accept us or bless us. In fact, we deserve his judgment. Are we willing? Are you willing to accept Christ and his word on his terms? Do we come before God with a humble recognition of our desperate need? We need a savior. We need someone to redeem us from our slavery to sin. We need to throw ourselves upon the mercy and the power of Jesus. And all those who do will find Jesus to be a, a wonderful rescuer and Lord. For he is the one who rescues enslaved people. Well, that's the first sign. Second sign. Uh, note here is somebody who restores the exiled. We see Jesus healing a deaf and mute man. Um, what a terrible disability that is. You're cut off from the normal interactions with your community, unable to hear what is said, unable to communicate what you think. What frustration. I mean, you, he was living like an exile in his own land. And once again, this is Gentile territory. Jesus is in the region of the Decapolis. And somehow the word has got out about what Jesus can do. Maybe it was that man, formerly known as Legion, who'd been sharing his story. But by the time uh, Jesus comes back to this territory, they're more receptive to Jesus. And um, again, Jesus graciously acts. And I, I, again, I'm struck by what a contrast his behavior is to many of the healing evangelists you'll sometimes see on Christian TV. He doesn't want to make a big show about this. He takes the man to a private place just with his disciples. He, he doesn't want to make a big show. Verse 33, after he took him aside, he away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh. Now, this is rather unusual. It certainly made an impression on the disciples, perhaps. Of course, Jesus was always teaching them something important in this healing. But the other aspect of this is that it's a very compassionate way of relating to a deaf man. Jesus couldn't explain verbally to him what he was about to do. And so he uses a kind of a form of sign language, fingers in his ears. This is going to be healed, spitting, touching his tongue. This is going to be fixed. And the first words that reverberate into the ears and the brain were ephaphtha, that is, be opened. And once again, the power of Jesus' word is displayed. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. Amazing. My daughter Amy just finished four-year speech therapy course. I don't think there's any known treatment that can achieve an instantaneous miracle like this, that someone can go from being mute to clear speech. Makes you think, doesn't it? What sort of person can, can do such incredible miracles? What sort of person can heal deaf and mute people? What sort of person can restore exiled people? Well, Mark gives us a big clue in the original Greek text that the, the, the New Testament was written in. The phrase that says that man had a speech impediment occurs only once in the New Testament here. And the other reference in the Greek version of the Old Testament is in Isaiah chapter 35. It was read to us earlier. It's a message of hope to captive exiles far away from Israel. Uh, 35 verse 4 says this, Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. And in verse 10 of that chapter, it says, And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will be the crown on their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Jesus sighs and says, if after, and the man is full of joy, he can speak, he can hear. God promised he would come again to ransom his exiled people and bring them home rejoicing. He was going to make a way through the desert. He was going to rescue people who were powerless because of their sin. And when God the Redeemer comes, 
these will be the remarkable signs that the blind will be able to see and their eyes will work the the, the deaf will be able to hear, their ears will work, and the lame will find that their legs have strength and they'll leap with joy and the tongue will sing his praises that once was mute. And what's the way in the desert called in Isaiah 35? The M8? No, not the M8. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness and it will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean, it says, will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not uh, go about on it. So here we are. We're in the Decapolis region. This is unclean territory. And we see Jesus restoring a deaf mute, releasing an exile, freeing the enslaved. And here's the big point, that Gentiles, non-Jewish people, who were once considered unclean, are now part of the ransomed of the Lord. They're on this highway of holiness. Because all who trust him can walk in the way of holiness with joy and gladness as they become pilgrims on, on their way to fellowship with God. Now, who is this person then who frees the enslaved, who restores the exiled, and lastly, who provides in the desert? Well, if we still haven't worked out who Jesus is, Mark gives us a third event that is a massive sign again. Uh, here we see Jesus providing uh, food to satisfy a crowd of 4,000 people in a very remote place. Chapter 8 verse 1 makes clear we're still in the uh, territory outside the land of Israel in those days. What days? Well, it was the days of when they were in the Decapolis region. And here we see again Jesus' great heart for people. He calls his disciples to him. Verse 2, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and they have nothing to eat. Uh, if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come long distances. Well, the disciples uh, reasonably point out that uh, the chances of getting food in this remote place are very slim, uh, let alone for 4,000 people. And then the disciples are treated to another unforgettable moment. With a mere seven loaves, and let's not forget the few small fish, he gets this huge crowd to sit down and get ready for a big picnic. He gives thanks and the disciples distribute it to the people. And once again, the people ate until they were satisfied. And the disciples still pick up seven big basketfuls. Well, it makes you think, doesn't it? Who is this person who can feed thousands of people in a deserted place? Does that sound like anyone you know? Well, of course, only God can do these things. Um, this is what God did for Israel at the time of the Exodus as they wandered through the desert to the promised land. Day by day, he provided manna for them. And here in the person of Jesus, God came to redeem his people. As we read on in Mark, we will see how this redemption plan is going to take place. Because on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus would once again bless bread, break it and give it to his disciples saying, This is my body broken for you. Mark is underlying that these are all signs of the Redeemer God. If you've been following uh, this series in Mark, you'll remember, of course, something very similar happened back in chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. So what's new here? Why does Mark show us another feeding miracle? Well, it happened, but I think it also says this. Chapter 6 is saying God is the, Jesus is, has come to redeem Israel, and chapter 7 and 8, that Jesus has come to redeem all of the rest of the world, the Gentiles too. This is the profound insight of the Syrophoenician woman. Even though Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, she trusts that God's superabundant blessing will spill over the borders of Israel's geography and ethnicity to be a blessing to the whole world and include her. And through these events, Jesus was teaching his disciples that the good news of God was for the whole world. These chapters would be especially precious to any today who are, who are not from a Jewish background like me. It was always God's purpose that he would, uh, through Israel, bless the whole world. That's what he says to Abraham right back in Genesis chapter 12. In Isaiah 49, as we learn about the mission of the suffering servant, it says this, It is too small a thing for my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel that I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of of the earth. Now if someone asks you later today what was the sermon about today, tell them this, Jesus is the Redeemer 
for the whole world. Jesus is the Redeemer for the whole world. Now, if you're not a Christian, um, then this woman really shows you how to respond to this Jesus. Take him at his word. Acknowledge your evil that separates you from God. Humble yourself before him today. Confess your sin to him and accept the forgiveness that he makes possible through the death of Jesus on your behalf. Now, what should we do as disciples today? Well, be reminded that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for all people. And yet we don't readily believe this. Uh, do you ever find yourself prejudging who is likely or unlikely to receive the gospel? There are some people we think, oh, that person probably could become a Christian. And others who think, oh, oh, I don't think they'd ever become a Christian. And so why bother sharing it with them because they're unlikely people? Well, when we think like that, we are so wrong. We never get it right. Who would have thought that this pagan woman from Syrophoenicia would get it? But she got it. This is good news for all people. I mean, who do you think is unlikely to become a Christian? Who do you think is someone that you would never imagine uh, that you know? Why don't you write down their name and start praying for them? I don't know. Is it one of your Islamic friends? Maybe it's a brother who's been hardened to the gospel for 30 years. I don't know. I don't, we all have people in our heads who think, oh, that's unlikely. But remember from God's word today, Jesus is the redeemer of the whole world. A few years ago, I listened to a radio documentary on the shock heavy metal artist Alice Cooper. And the program was presented by Johnny Lydon uh, from the punk rock group, The Sex Pistols. And he said this, then he did the most outrageous thing in his life. He became a born again Christian. When asked by the British Sunday Times newspaper in 2001 how a rebellious shock rocker could be a Christian, Cooper said this, Drinking beer is easy. Trashing your hotel room is easy. But being a Christian, that's a tough call. That's real rebellion. Who are we praying for at the moment? Are we praying for opportunities to share the gospel? Are we praying for boldness to take those opportunities? Um, who knows what the Lord will do in this week ahead? Uh, we can reach out to people. Uh, we can share uh, sermons that, uh, in this Mark series that, that, that we think will be helpful for them to hear. What great opportunities we still have to connect with a world that Jesus has great compassion for and through us wants to reach.